Well, if you would, go ahead and open your Bibles with me to Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians. And as you do, today is week five of our six-week series entitled, We Believe, the Doctrines That Unite Us. Today, we're, we're taking time to look at what we believe regarding the church and the ordinances of the church. Now, if I've learned anything in what's hard to believe, now 20 years of pastoral ministry, it's that most people don't have a, a clear understanding of who or what the church is and how she's intended to function. And subsequently, because of that misunderstanding, they don't have a clear understanding of, of really what it means to be a Christian. One reason for this certainly centers around what one has or hasn't been taught about the church. But another reason likely centers around what's been caught. We learn from formal teaching, but we also learn from things that we observe, things that we experience. Sadly, when it comes to the church, many of us have experienced and even witnessed some, some unhealthy and even hurtful examples, which naturally does what? It, it jades our understanding. And here's the reality. Our bad experiences, as bad and as painful as they may be, our, our misinformed understandings or, or whatever, they don't in any way change the reality of, of who or what the church is. Praise God. Nor do they change how the church is to function. Which means, regardless of how hard it may be, our jadedness that we experience, it cannot be used in any valid sense as an ongoing excuse to never join with another local church. See, today we're, we're looking at 1 Corinthians. And let's be clear, the Corinthian church is by no means an example of a healthy, functioning church. No one is looking to the church in Corinth and saying, follow that example. Like, this church has got it all figured out. They are the epitome of health. They're doing it right. Follow them. Nobody's saying that. No, their dysfunction is the reason that this letter even exists. Paul addressing the division that is taking place within this church from which we actually learn a, a great deal about the church. So not an exhaustive study of 1 Corinthians by any means. But what I do want to do today is make some what I believe are key observations and, and divide this sermon really into two parts. The first section looking at the church catapulting off what we believe about the, the church, what the Bible teaches about the church, and the second, looking at her, her ordinances. So starting with the church, our statement of faith reads, we believe in the one holy universal church made up of all who trust Jesus Christ as Savior, Lord, and supreme treasure. We believe that God calls believers to unite in local churches as a means of helping each other preeminently value Christ by praising him together, growing in our love and knowledge of him, stirring each other up to love and good deeds, and practicing all other Christian graces, all for the glory of God and the joy of the Christian. This statement serving really as a very, very basic summary of what we believe about the church. What I want to do now is just kind of flesh that out just a little bit more, but by no means able to cover it all. But look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is simply Paul's introduction to his letter. 
But when we look at verse 2, I, be, I believe it offers a great deal of insight regarding the understanding of the church. Starting with like point number one, or observation number one, notice how the church belongs to God. Because how does Paul address his letter as he starts it? To the church of God. Which means what? It means the church belongs to God. It doesn't belong to the people, but rather we the people belong to God. Now you talk about humbling. It's a very humbling reality. This means no, no pastor or person can say with any true ownership sense, hey, this is my church, or I built this church. Now, God may use his people, certainly does use his people, but only in such a way that he uses a farmer in the field. We plant and we water, uh, but it's God who gives the growth. And because the church belongs to God, she must function how? As God himself has designed. Finding his design where? Well, the Bible. The blueprints of God's design for his church are found in the Bible. Want to know how the church is to look, how she is to function, who is to comprise her? We look to the Bible. That's even why we preach the way that we, we do. Typically, not through this particular series, but typically just walking through books of the Bible. Just walking through. We call it expository preaching or it's expositional preaching. We're just exposing God's word to God's people and we want to obey what God's word says. Why? Because the church belongs to God. Number two, the, the church is local and universal. It's a local and universal people. Looking again at verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth. Paul writing this letter not to the church in Ephesus, nor to the church in Philippi, but to the church, church where? To the church in Corinth. Telling us what in, in the process? That there is such thing as a local church. It's why we have letters in the New Testament written to all these various different churches. The local church in Corinth called to be saints together with, very important language that we see here in this verse 2, with who? Who is the church in Corinth called to be saints together with? All those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both their Lord and ours. Meaning what? Meaning the saints in, in Corinth, the local church in Corinth, are, are called by God to be saints together with who? All those in every place. So together with the saints in Ephesus and Galatia and Rome and Philippi, throughout all the nations, called to be saints together in Christ. Which means what? It means the church isn't just local, that the church is also universal. The universal being all Christians, and not just Christians presently to here on the globe, but all Christians through all, all of time, anyone who has ever followed the Lord in faith. So consider this illustration by Jonathan Lehman as a means of example. I've used it before and I will use it again, but I find it very helpful Consider with me the, the imagery of an embassy. Being close to D.C., we're all fairly familiar with an embassy. But an embassy does what? Well, it's an institution. It's an institution that represents one nation inside of another nation. It looks after the home interests in whatever nation that, it, that it's in. So the U.S. Embassy in Kenya, for example, is sovereign U.S. soil looking out for U.S. interests in Kenya, recognizing and protecting U.S. citizens who are in Kenya. You can fill in the blank of any other country, same thing. Now, the embassy itself, it doesn't have the power to make someone a U.S. citizen, does it? No. But what does it have the power to do? 
but has the power to affirm or recognize those who already are U.S. citizens. And how do they do that? If you've ever had an experience with an embassy, how how do they recognize you as, as a citizen? Well, the fastest and easiest way to do so is to show them your passport. You show them your passport, they scan it, information comes up, there you are, you're a U.S. citizen, you're identified. Now, if you are like me and have a moment when you're overseas and you lose your passport, <laughs> like, what do they do? Well, then they're going to have to type in your information and look you up and go from there. And eventually, you're, Lord willing, you're going to pop up in the computer and be like, oh, there's Jeremy Todd. He's a, a U.S. citizen. But now I can't just walk up to the gates of the embassy and say, hey, I'm a United States citizen. I mean, I could. Right? I mean, we can walk up and say just about anything, but what basis are they going to believe my words? Just say, oh, yeah, I'm going to take his word for it. Come on in. Right? Is, is that how it works? Anyway, the, the, the point being, we, we don't affirm ourselves as citizens. It's the embassy that affirms, yes, this is, or no, this isn't a U.S. citizen based upon the verifiable evidence. And here's how this applies to the local church. The universal church, the the kingdom of God being where our heavenly citizenship lies. So all Christians are citizens of the heavenly kingdom. Every one of us. Which means what as it applies to this present world? Well, it means that we're strangers, we're, we're aliens living in a foreign land. It means that if we are in Christ, that this world is not our home. That's the reason for that unsettledness that we experience. But this is where the the local church comes into play, as the local church is the place in this foreign world where we who are citizens of heaven are recognized as heavenly citizens. The local church serving as local embassies of the heavenly kingdom. Go anywhere in the world where there are faithful, gospel-believing, and preaching churches, and we have little embassies of God's kingdom. Now the question is, how do we identify heavenly citizens? Number three, third observation. The church is comprised of those sanctified in Christ Jesus. So still in verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. What does Paul mean by those, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus? Well, Paul's referring to those who have been born again. As we looked at last week, the doctrine of salvation, the the fruits of sanctification, identify believers as those who are set apart for God. As people who are set apart as holy and blameless before Him. Both in our standing before God and in how we live our life. Living our lives as a holy people. As 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us, the will of God is our sanctification. Fleeing from, turning from the things of impurity to pursuing the things of of holiness. Why? For, For God has not called us to impurity or for impurity, but for holiness. We are a set apart people to be holy and blameless. Yeah, but Jeremy, that, that may be the calling, but that's not been my experience with the local church. Maybe that's what you're thinking in your head right now, thinking, I, I haven't really had that type of experience. And there are multiple reasons for this. I'll flesh out two of them. The first, I think the most overarching, overarching reason being our ongoing sin. See, sanctification doesn't equal instant glorification. Wish it did, but it doesn't. It leads to our glorification, but it doesn't equal it. So if we're in Christ, we have been redeemed, yes. We've received the Spirit, yes. 
And the Spirit now makes us aware of and convicts us of our, of our sin. Yes. But we know that, that doesn't mean we don't at times respond sinfully to one another. We will at times sin against one another even when we really, really, really don't want to do that. Can't overlook the reality that, that, that church hurt is always in one way or another the result of sin. You can't deny the reality that even godly people pursuing holiness can sometimes do some ungodly things. It's sad. It's heartbreaking. It hurts. It's the case. And we praise God for the work of the Spirit in bringing conviction of sin and repentance. We thank God for the forgiveness that is found in Christ. But now the second reason many of us have experienced unhealthy churches is because of how churches have practiced membership. It comes back to unregenerate church membership. That is receiving members into the body or retaining members within the body who show no visible sign of ongoing signs of the new birth. Repentance and, and faith and the pursuit of holiness are, are not evidential markers in their life. Which means you have people who identify themselves as, as members of a particular local church. People who, by all accounts, believe themselves to be Christians and subsequently have local churches identifying people as members who show no biblical signs of, of faith. What do, you, what do you think that does to the witness of the local church? Both locally within the area, but also the, the, how one relate to one another within the local church. Like, what are unregenerate people going to be more committed to when push comes to shove? God's word or the, the traditions that they've grown accustomed to that may or may not be rooted in God's word? What are unregenerate people going to be more likely to, to go in the direction of God's word firmly standing or going with the culture as it shifts one direction or another? And it's why such an, an unhealthy practice of church membership leads to, to more church hurt and a very unhealthy gospel witness. Which is why we, we are presently working to foster like meaningful and accountable church membership. We don't want to ever see like names just simply listed on a roll. Oh, they signed a sheet of paper. You're a member. <laughs> so what? what? What does that have to do with anything? Is just signing a, a, a paper, like, is that what it takes? Is there meaning behind our commitment? That's what we want to know. Like, is there, what, what is meaningful behind being a member of the church? And for the truth be told, most of us have never found real meaning behind church membership in any church we've ever been a part of. We get a vote on a budget? Woohoo! That sounds like fun. Got to come to a members meeting or I'll forget that. I'll take a nap and y'all handle everything else. <laughs> no. It means you're committing to and covenanting to live out our, our lives, our beliefs together. We're going to look at this, these covenantal commitments next week. But a people sanctified in Christ is who the church is. And that's what the local church is intended to display. And one of the primary means of, of doing this displaying is through the ordinances of the church. Our statement of faith in reference to what we believe regarding the ordinance is reading, we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ has committed two ordinances to the local church. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. We believe baptism is an obligation upon every believer. Wherein a person is immersed in water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And as a sign of their fellowship with the death and resurrection of Christ. 
and the forgiveness of sin. We believe that the Lord's Supper is in no sense a sacrifice, but was instituted by Christ to commemorate his death, to stimulate faithful obedience to all Christ's commands, and to be a pledge and renewal of, the, of their communion with him and with one another. We believe that these two ordinances should be observed and administered until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So observation number four. The church is baptized into Christ Jesus. Look with me at verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you. My brothers, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did, did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I, I did not know whether I baptized anyone else, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now what Paul is doing here is he's dealing directly with the division that's taking place within the church regarding baptism. But it's not baptismal division like we might think of today. Notice how this division has nothing to do with whether or not the believer should be baptized. Why might that be the case? Because as messed up as the church in Corinth was, <laughs> they would have laughed at the absurdity, at, at the thought of, of someone identifying themselves as, as a Christian and yet being a member of the local church without being baptized. They would have laughed at that. That would have been unheard of. Just, just read through the New Testament, try to find an unbaptized Christian within the New Testament. No such person exists. And it's the reason you won't find a command in Corinthians to be baptized. Because the command wasn't necessary. Baptism was already taking place. That command is found other places in Scripture. It's an implicit to this church. If you're a Christian, you're baptized. You're baptized in obedience to Christ's commands. And if you believe yourself to to be a Christian, maybe here today, and you've never followed the Lord and believer's baptism, well, then we invite you to do so. We'd love to talk with you about this. But see, their division isn't over whether or not that they should be baptized. It's not even over how one should be baptized. Their division is over who they're being baptized in the name of. You notice that? So I'm saying, well, hey, Paul baptized me. It'd be like, like some well-known pastor, like, oh, so-and-so, he baptized me. In this case, it was, since Paul baptized me, I, I follow Paul. Others say, well, hey, Apollos baptized me, and so I follow Apollos. And Paul's like, were any of you baptized in my name? Rhetorical question here. In fact, did I baptize any of you? Well, other than Gaius and Crispus. Oh, yeah, well, other than Stephanus, I think I baptized them as well. But I didn't baptize anybody else. Point being, were you baptized in my name? No, no, you weren't. Whose name were you baptized in? Yeah, the name of Christ. Buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in the newness of life. His point being, why does it matter who baptized you? What matters is the one whose name we've been baptized into. Our unity as the church is in Christ, not the pastor or the person who baptized us, but Christ. Christ. 
So if you're, if you're coming from another local church, maybe you're here today and you're checking us out and you're like, I, I don't know. Like, you're coming from another local church to join this one? Well, there's two things that we want to know about your baptism. One, was it done by a church of like faith? Meaning, like, do they believe what we believe as it pertains to God and the gospel? That we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. So the baptism itself has nothing to do with your salvation. And two, was it done by a church of like practice? So believers' baptism by immersion. And definitely more here that we can flush out and happy to have a conversation if necessary. But now if anyone were attempt to use Paul's words in verse 17 where he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. If they were to use that in any attempt to de-emphasize the importance of baptism in the life of the local church, well, they would prove in that moment that they don't really understand Paul's understanding of baptism. Consider Paul's words in Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. See, when when someone who has already experienced a new birth, like we looked at last week, then enters into the baptismal waters. They do so symbolically entering into those waters, the waters of God's judgment. Because while water assuredly brings life, it also brings what? It brings death. Think of the great flood that covered the earth back in Genesis. What was the result of that flood? Well, every living thing that walked the earth was killed by the flood of God's judgment. Except for who? Those who took shelter under the ark of God's mercy and grace. So we as believers, we we enter into the baptismal waters publicly identifying ourselves as sinners deserving of God's judgment. And then we're buried under the water of God's judgment. Because if we don't come back up, what happens? We die. It's what we deserve. We're testifying to that reality. So in that moment, we're symbolically symbolically showing the world that, that we have been baptized into Christ. Our old life is gone. It's dead. It's buried. Christ receiving our judgment for us and we're raised with Christ to walk in a newness of life. We're a new creation. That's what we're telling the world, which is why baptism is required for church membership. Not because it saves, it doesn't. But it's the person entering the baptismal waters saying, I confess Christ as my only hope in life and in death. And I commit to live my life in obedience to his commands along with the church. And it's the local church affirming to the best of our knowledge that this person is in fact a follower of Christ. And we are committing to live with him or her in obedience to Christ's commands. There's commitment It's a covenantal relationship. So sticking with the embassy illustration, our baptism and our confession of faith is our passport. It's our public entry into the family of God. And what do families do? They gather together. So observation number five, the church comes together. Look with me at verse 17 in chapter 11. Flip over there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. But in the following instructions, I I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Remember, this is a church in dysfunction. Dysfunction. 
verse 18. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. We'll pause there for a moment. Notice here, again, how Paul's addressing division within the church. This time, centering around the Lord's Supper, the division with both ordinances. And, And we'll get to the Lord's Supper portion here in a moment, but the observation from these verses is, is what? Look at the phrase, when you come together. When you come together. It's used both in verse 17 and verse 18. Verse 18 even saying, when you come together as a church. The observation or the point being that while division existed within the church, and while Paul couldn't, couldn't praise them for how they were practicing the Lord's Supper, he's having to condemn them for how they're practicing the Lord's Supper. What are they doing? They're still coming together as the church. They're, they're still gathering together as the church, which brings the question, for what purpose? Like, why are they doing this? Why are they coming together? Well, let's explore that in observation number six. The church partakes of the Lord's Supper when it comes together. Let's pick up reading in chapter 11, verse 20. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So there's quarreling and there's division surrounding the church's partaking of the Lord's Supper. Lots of reasons why this disunity existed. Verse 21, making clear that they weren't taking it together. Looks like the, the wealthier families were going ahead and eating and drinking before the, those others who were less wealthy could even arrive. Some were going hungry while others were getting drunk. Those who have humiliating those who have not. And Paul's like, this is wrong on so many levels. Why? Just think about what the Lord's Supper is intended to represent. Remembrance of Christ's sacrificial life and his death. Christ's humility not being displayed at all by the church of Corinth. Which is why Paul is writing and saying, okay, here is how you're supposed to take it when you gather together. Verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's done in remembrance. Again, this is a family meal. It's a family time of reflection. Verse 25, in the same way, also he took the cup from after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's Supper serving as an act of continual remembrance, reflection, celebration, longing until Christ returns. Which leaves the question, How often were they partaking of the Lord's Supper? Because just a thought here from observation, if they were doing this just once a month or once a quarter, do you think that this level of division would have existed? I mean, it certainly could. Especially if it's it's been going on for any significant amount of time. But a more frequent partaking would likely lend to greater division. 
Every week, this, this humiliation taking place and would certainly lead to division. But again, just, just a question of observation on my end as I look at verse 20 that reads, when you come together. Because it appears this is taking place every time that they come together. Not just ever so often, but every single time that they come together. And every time the church comes together, what are they to do? What are we to do? You ever thought about that? Like, what does the Bible really say that we're supposed to be doing when we come together as the church? Well, if you would, hold your finger where you're at and turn back with me to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Give you a moment to turn there. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. As soon as Derek finds it, then we're rolling. He's going to be my judge for everybody else. No pressure. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It reads, And they, referring to the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And what we find listed here are four things the baptized and gathered local churches to do. What are they? One, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching every time they gathered. To fellowship every time they gathered. To, to the breaking of bread. Now, in the church background that I grew up with, <laughs> you know, like, Southern, down, south, Baptist church background, breaking of bread, was that was the potluck, right? Bucket of chicken, casseroles, desserts, food poisoning, great memories growing up. But all, all joking aside, the breaking of the bread refers to the Lord's Supper. And then the, the fourth thing the church devoted themselves to was to prayer. These are the four things every local church gathering would contain. Now, were these the only things that the church contain, that the gathering contained? Certainly not. What about singing? I believe singing was very much a part of the local church gathering. We see that throughout Scripture. But the point is, the breaking of bread was likely more frequent than what most of us have experienced. Consider one more passage with me in, in Acts before we return to Corinthians, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And, and we turn here because I believe this gives us an even clearer indication of the frequency. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, saying, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread. The first day of the week being Sunday. The Lord's Day, the day when the church historically gathers together to, to worship. And what do, we, what do they do when they gather? They break bread. Actually, the language is when we gather together to break bread, which indicates that the purpose of their gathering was to break bread, to break bread on the Lord's Day as a local embassy, a, a local gathering of God's children at the start of every week. So the baptized church gathering on the Lord's Day, the day of Christ's resurrection, each week to reflect and remember Christ's life, death, and resurrection, and his promise to return. As they, again, a baptized, gathered group of believers, partook of the Lord's Supper the family partaking of the weekly family meal. Which is why we, we, we fence the table each time we take of the table. Only those who have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and presently trusting in Christ as our only hope in life and in death are, are welcome to come to the table. We don't have time to unpack the following verses in great detail, but just read them along. Verse 27, back in Corinthians chapter 11. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. 
This table reserved only for those who have experienced the new birth, have followed the Lord in baptism and are presently living a life of repentance and faith. We fence for the protection of those who have not trusted in Christ as their only hope in life and in death. And yes, so much more that we could flush out here. So if you, again, if you have questions, let's talk. Now, I know some, some today will object to the frequency of a weekly partaking by suggesting it will diminish the meaning. I used to be one of those people thinking, like, we'll be taking this every week, the Lord's Supper every week, and it's just going to become too routine. It's going to lose its meaning. But here are a few thoughts from these texts that have shifted my thinking. One, I have to ask, do we apply the same reasoning to the other things that are listed for the gathering? Like for preaching, for prayer, and to fellowship? All of, law, all of which, with the breaking of bread, were listed in the weekly gathering of what they did. So one, if we use this reasoning to think oh, it just will become too routine, it's going to lose its meaning, does that mean that we should not fellowship as often because it might lose its meaning? Does that mean that we need to reserve the preaching of God's word to once a quarter or once a month because it will lose its meaning? Or we don't need to, to pray nearly as often because it might lose its meaning. I don't think any of us would say that, would we? No. Two, by fencing the table, we also offer a, a biblical invitation to respond to the gospel. It's not the walking of an aisle that some of us may have grown up with, but it's the weekly reflection of, am I trusting in Christ as my only hope in life and in death? It's a weekly reflection for everyone who's sitting under the preaching of God's word to say, am I living a life of repentance and faith? If not, why am I coming to the table? It's the weekly opportunity for those of all ages to be posed with the question, what keeps me from being able to come to the table and to partake? Let's have those conversations. Oh, I want children asking their parents those questions. What, why can't I come to the table? Let's have those conversations. And I believe in doing so, that will lead to more people following the Lord in believer's baptism. Biblically. Three, we went a, a year, a year, without partaking of the Lord's Supper during the season of COVID restrictions. Let that sink in for a moment. Over a year, partially because of health concerns, but primarily because so many of us were unable to come to the table for one reason or another. We weren't able to come together as a body because we were a broken body. We were a scattered body. And instead of feasting, it was a season to fast. By God's grace, that fast has been broken. And during that season, especially the longer it went, there were some of you who occasionally asked, like, when are we going to take the Lord's Supper again? Some expressed a sincere missing of the Lord's Supper. But overall, that number of those voices was very few. And the perception, whether right or wrong, was that collectively, again, by not means everybody, but as a whole, the Lord's Supper wasn't extremely missed by most within our body. And again, I could be, I could be wrong, I, but I can't help but wonder if it's because of the infrequency of which we have been protecting the Lord's Supper during normal times typically partaking the first Sunday of every month. And I can't, I can't help but wonder if the Lord's Supper, if it had been a weekly part of our church gathering, would we have missed it more? I tend to think that the answer is yes. Just as we missed the singing, we missed the fellowship when we were forced online. People kept saying, oh, I wish, I wish we could come together and I wish we could sing. Why? Because we sing every week together. 
Oh, I want to fellowship with the body. Why? Because we're able to fellowship t- t- together. Online service provided a preaching of God's word, but it, it, it voided out the possibility of these other things. So starting today, we're going to begin regularly partaking of the Lord's Supper when we gather as the church at the start of every week. Because if anything is going to become too routine in our lives, oh, let it be a continual reflection upon cross, the cross of Christ. Let it be a continual reflection upon his grace and his mercy. Let it be a continual longing for him to return and to make all things new. So if you've been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and are presently trusting in Christ as your only hope in life and in death, living a life of repentance and faith, then we invite you to come to the table this morning. For everyone else, we are so glad that you are here. And we humbly, though, ask you to refrain But at this time, at the same time, we would love to talk with you about how you can come to the table in the future. No greater, no conversation I'd rather have with you than how that could be possible. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pray and then the table will be open to baptized believers. You come and receive the elements and then we'll partake of them together momentarily. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for sending your son to live and to die to redeem your church. The very fact that we're able to call you Father is a testament to your mercy and grace. And, Lord, our desire as your children is to walk faithfully in obedience to your commands to live how you'd have us to live. So, Lord, for for any unrepentant sin within our lives, we pray you'll, you'll bring us to conviction and in conviction to repentance. May we flee sin and pursue holiness. May we walk as the people you've called us to be. And now as we come to your table, reflecting upon the the sacrifice that made our new life possible. We do so celebrating the hope that is found in Christ. We do so longing for the day when we will partake of the marriage supper of the Lamb together with Christ. But until that day comes, give us the perseverance to walk in faithful obedience, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Come to the table.